But yeah, if I'm doing a straight leg bound, guess where my deformity is coming at? at the hip. I'm going I'm to make the hip take that blow. Because at the same time, when I'm sprinting, I'll make the hip take the blow because I don't want the movement at the knee joint or the ankle joint. So see what I'm saying? Where am I going to control? How am I going to control the movement at these joints? And that's what I'm saying. We move at joints. Joints don't move. We move at a joint. That was a Darien Bar, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by our longtime sponsor, SimplyFaster.com. There's two items I'd like to talk to you about today that you can find in Simply Faster's online store. Whether you're a coach or an athlete, these are both things that you'll find highly useful as tools in your training toolbox. The first is blood flow restriction training methods. And after hearing about blood flow restriction training for years now, as well as the results that athletes are getting with it, especially in, for example, uh, lactate sports like swimming, 100 meter freestyle. And not only hearing of that, but also seeing how much some swimmers had liked that type of training method, I knew I had to start trying it out myself. So I've been utilizing the air bands. I really enjoy it, both the feeling while I'm actually training with them, as well as seeing the visual result of spending time training with the methods and then the strength result. They've been a really cool training tool, and I would definitely recommend checking into air bands. Uh, SimplyFaster.com also has B Strong brand blood flow restriction. The second item is the VMAX Pro. And this is a new option for velocity-based training, barbell tracking. It provides valuable load-based data, including speed in all phases of a lift, and it delivers key metrics such as power, velocity, distance, as well as duration of effort. The VMAX Pro system measures any lift you can think of. It's portable, durable, and intuitive. You can check out these two items and much more at our sponsor, simplyfaster.com's online store. Let's get on to the show. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Great to have you here, and thanks for tuning in to another show. Today we have guest Adarian Barr. Adarian is a coach, an inventor, an innovator. He is a former track and field coach at multiple university levels. He now works in the private sector and does tons of coaching clinics throughout the country, uh, as well as the world. Adarian has been one of my absolute biggest influences on movement in sport. I see the world of athletic movement so differently now than I used to, even just six years ago before I met him for the first time. And one of the biggest things that I've learned from Adarian is um, not just looking at, okay, you need to produce more force, for example, or an athlete needs to be stiffer, but really getting into what joints do, how each joint operates in that athletic movement, be it jumping, sprinting, throwing. And the deeper I've been able to go on that level, the less, I guess you could say, general I feel like I've needed to operate in how I communicate with athletes, how I look at adaptations, and just that totality of movement. And so that's what we'll be talking about on the podcast today is just getting into stiffness. For example, when someone says an athlete needs stiffer ankles, that athlete needs stiffer ankles, stiffer feet. And we'll be talking about stress, strain, deformity. Where do athletes need to resist force? Where do they need to deform? How does this relate to common athletic skills? After listening to this podcast, you'll have a broader view, a broader lens on how to interpret that term when it comes to how athletes are going through their plyometrics, going through their sprint constraints, going through their lifting motions, looking at where the stress and the strain is and how that applies to movement. This was a really great show to do in that regard and excited to get this show to you guys. Just two quick things before we start. One is there is visual and video to go with all this stuff. Yes, this is an audio show. If you want to see more regarding what Adarian is talking about, you can head to the show notes uh, on Just Fly Sports for this podcast, and there's some videos that fit with some of these descriptions. Secondly, is just quickly, I want to go through a first and second class lever because we will be speaking on that throughout the show. And just when it comes to the foot and ankle, a first class lever is like a seesaw with the fulcrum in the middle and a load on either side. There's actually the load and the effort, but with the foot, that fits with the foot being flat on the ground as the shin translates forward over it. A class two lever is more like a wheelbarrow where the fulcrum point is that wheel. The effort is you lifting up the handles. And that fits with getting to the ball of the foot in movement as the heel comes upward. So think after you get to that mid stance point in spring, the heel is going to be coming up as the knee is going forward. So two important points of distinction. That being said, let's get to this episode with Coach Adarian Barr. 
Darren, good to have you back, man. You know, I, one thing that I, I knew you had done in college, and, and I guess I was a little confused if it was your major or a project you were doing, but I know you had done work in music. And I know that a lot of times in the coaching tree, or you, you come up and it's you learn you learn physiology and you know, different things with energy systems and a different array of subjects when you're growing as a coach. But you don't hear about like music that often. I, I've also known a coach who was a sculptor early on and, and, and <laughs> taught, and taught the little shapes a lot. So I'm just curious, you know, in your uh, educational years, uh, your relationship to music and the process of athletics. Well, thanks for having me on again. The music came about because I was uh, in a master's program. And at the time, I think I was coaching also. And, uh, you know, I was in the triple jump and, and long jump. But, you know, when you triple jump, they always talk about that rhythm. Bow, bow, you know, they always talk about that rhythm. And, and I'm thinking like, ah, OK, and I triple jump, but I never did still understand the rhythm. I never understood it, you know. And I, nobody's never said, like, this is the rhythm of a 50 foot triple jumper. This is the rhythm of a 55 foot triple jumper. This is the rhythm of a 47 foot triple jumper, you know. And so uh, so what I wanted to do was see if we could extract rhythm from the virus triple jumpers, you know, at different levels and stuff like that. And then could we use that to, to teach that distance of jumping, you know, to athletes and stuff like that. And, and so I remember when I came up with it, you know, like I said, I, I, I didn't know much about music. So I went to the music department and, and they was like, oh, we're not really interested, <laughs> you know? And, I, and I'm like, you got no grad students, nobody. Oh, we're not really interested. You know, it was funny. And at that time, like I said, video was, was consuming so much memory space. Music was. And then you, I was trying to sync the music and the video. It was this lag time. I mean, it was crazy, you know. So at the end of the, you know, at you know, at the end of a thesis or something like that, you have to, you know, you write limits, delimits, all that kind of stuff, and for further consideration. And I said, well, this is gonna have to wait till we get faster computers. It's <laughs> 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 just they, they, they weren't powerful enough. They weren't fast enough, you know, what, for what I had access to. So and now we got, you know, coaches eye. And you just, you know, it's it's a funny, it's a funny thing how. You know, but you go back to, you know, like I said, that was, that was 22 years ago. Yeah. I, 22 I, years ago. I remember computers. Yeah. About, yeah, when I was eight, so about 30 years ago. And it was, I mean, it was, it's funny, even um, when I was doing my master's thesis in biomechanics um, 15 years ago now, I remember like they were talking about what they had to do uh, like 10 years before that. And I was like, that would take forever. I mean, I felt like yeah. I had to go through enough lines of code in the technology we had at the time. So that's right. Uh, right. Right. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's, that becomes a thing, but that's, that honed my early days of watching video, you know, it, it really honed my skills. Of, I mean, you got to remember, I think 720 was the highest video capability we had at the point in time and it was grainy. And so you sit there and you staring at the video, you know, and you got to remember once you play the tape too many times, it was no good. Every time you played the tape, yeah. it, it degraded, it degraded, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> Crazy days, man. Crazy days. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is interesting to think on things that level on that level. I mean, I know in our time that we'd spent working together and I, me learning from you back in San Francisco Bay Area, you had talked about dance a lot, hip hop, break dancing or popping and right. popping and locking right. and things like that. And if you think about things on the level of, well, there's impulses and there's rhythm. It's a rhythmic coordination of impulses, athletic movement. Exactly. And right, we, just, right, we don't right. look at it that way that often. It's something you feel too. I think that's that's the thing is it's hard to necessarily explain to like a group of students unless they're doing something with their own body. Like, oh, it's like this. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's part of it too. Is is just what you said. You know, you you have this this rhythmic impulses that you got to deal with. You know, you're trying to you know, and and that's why, like, say when you look at, at the lockers, the breakdancers, and the poppers, and all those guys, you know, you know, they're excellent at it. You know, I mean, it's like you see them guys do some things. You go, man, this is this is craziness. And 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 and, and the thing about it is, that's why I keep telling people you got to watch those guys because it's funny how over in this world somebody say I'm doing animal flow. Well, you missed that break dance over there doing the warm, right? Right, you missed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, yeah. I used to do the warm when I was in high school. I, right. I was super athletic. I tried to do it. You know, I could still do it, but I remember I used to like to do the no arm worm or whatever. And I was like, man, yeah. I was. I, I actually I look back on my high school years on like uh, do these different athletic boxes, and I, I look at it that ability to segment and impulse the spine. I was like, dang, that that took some serious athleticism. It might right? Yeah, it's crazy. Right, right, right. And I think people forget about that, you know, and so you see these things, even this control of muscle, just like, you know, like you said, when you talk about, you know, like, like somebody's doing King Tut, you are in control of that, you know, somebody ticking or, 
you know, somebody strobing or something like that, you know. I remember when, I remember when, it, when the big thing was when they had, the, like, when they, when they do the, the heartbeat, you know, you go, that that was, I mean, to, to actually watch somebody illustrate their, their, their heart popping out their chest, you know, you go, that's crazy control, crazy. And so I don't think that, that, that people get it, but that's why, you know, like I said, you bring it back over to this side, what we're searching for is what they're doing. We're not saying these guys would come over and run fast, jump high, but what they're doing, that's what we're searching for. Yeah, the, I might have to put the the King Tut. Like that was in the eighties. Was I might have to put that yeah, in the yeah, show yeah. notes for a bunch of people <laughs> to look at, including myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it's crazy and stuff. And and like for me, like a lot of times people get upset when I say something or because I don't agree with something. But even like you know when I see that world and I see stiff, and then I come over to this world and they say that's stiff. That's not close. <laughs> you know that's. Yeah. <laughs> That's not close. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's a good segue into a, a main portion of what I wanted to ask you about because I think that it's very easy to generalize uh, just terms, especially. I mean, human movement is complex. I mean, there's simple elements that hopefully we can communicate it in a simple way, and athletes can learn it in a simple way. But there's a lot going on under the hood, so to speak, that's pretty complex. And so a lot of right. times it gets generalized into, well, just be stiff, just produce more force, and there's a right. lot of nuance to all that, but. A lot of times people will talk about ankle stiffness. I'm just curious what that term means to you. So just, just I'll, I'll start with a general question. What does stiffness mean to you? And then we'll, we'll get into some layers of that. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, stiffness to me means you're not moving very well, very fluidly, you know, in, in a sense. And I always thought about if I felt like my joints were stiff, that's not a good term. If I wake up in the morning, I'm like, man, I'm kind of stiff. That's not a good term. You know, if I got arthritis and I got a stiff elbow, that's not a good term. So, so to me, stiffness is not a good term in a sense, you know, because at some point in time, that just means that that joint's not moving. Uh, but I think part of the issue is, too, when you ask other people to say, you know, people talk about ankle stiffness and you go, OK, show me on this video. And they say the heel, they, they may say like the heel doesn't move downward. Well, that's the heel, not the ankle. So we are we off base already because I'm like, to me, the ankle's moving. The tip is moving forward, the foot's moving up, so there's movement at the ankle joint. So if there's movement at the ankle joint, how can that be stiff? And then you go, okay, well, if you don't want the foot, the heel to drop, you're talking about a, a joint at the foot that you're worried about. So, so because that's what's happening is when the heel drops, where are you at? You're on the transverse arch. And so the MTP joints are the ones that are, that are working up and down at this point in time, not the ankle. So, so I think even that there where people don't even get the location right. So we wonder why we all confused about this word stiff. And so then you go there, then you go, okay. To me, the other part comes in here where you go, okay. Like, for instance, stiff ankle to me, if, if we're going to use the word stiff ankle with ankles not moving, that's a class two lever. And so, so then, you, then I go, oh, so you want, you, want, you want to land in a class two lever. And then they go, what's that? Oh, so see, once again, here we go, you know. Oh, you want to land in a class two lever with your weight in front of the focal point. Okay, get, I can do that. But that's not a stiff ankle. That's just a class two level. And once again, you understand that you don't have to train it. Just land in that position and keep it going. Yeah, I think that it's we were talking about this a little bit before uh, we, we pressed record. But I think the idea that it's very popular to coach into positions or uh, like I could take a picture and are you in this still position? I mean, obviously you're moving and there's lots right. of frames between that, but it's it's like life is motion. And we always have to realize that everything's always moving. And I think that it's almost like, in my mind, some, sometimes the way that we, um, that coaches a lot of times gravitate towards like seeing a position, trying to get athletes into that position, that kind of goes hand in hand with also being stiff. And I think it is just terminology because there is, I mean, you can't be like, if your limbs were all just like noodles, <laughs> you're, you're just going to fall into the ground, basically. There has to be a point of resistance. And maybe that's what I want to ask you is how do you see that interplay between, yeah, and obviously I, I will say too, like I, I kind of was thinking about it and I was like, well, if you wanted stiff ankles, well, you could just put, have your ankles put in a cast for like, you know, a month. That would, <laughs> that would yield some pretty yeah, stiff ankles yeah, 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 you know, if yeah, that's yeah, what you yeah, wanted. Yeah, and, and that's, yeah, and, and maybe, yeah. you know, I think words do matter. But Castification of the ankle? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It'll be stiff. <laughs> that, would be, that would give you a really <laughs> stiff ankle if you wanted it. But I think what people are really looking for is they're looking for the ability to provide adequate resistance at that instant that it's absolutely needed. So what, how do you see that? Because obviously, we have to have a point of resistance that also fits with that 
perpetual motion machine. Yeah, that that makes that makes sense because, like I said, I I want this wheel to roll in a certain direction. I don't want it to go flat, and and so basically, I, you know, I do get it that that I don't want it land on my foot and the, and the tire basically goes flat. I want it to keep rolling in a certain direction, and so at that point in time, I think that's where people have gotten lost at too. With with you know, like somebody will say intrinsic foot muscles, and then you go, what about the next transit ones? What, what about you know they? I'm gonna I'm gonna get the intrinsic foot muscles stronger. What about the extrinsic ones? They're still foot mm-hmm. muscles, and so so a lot of this times to me once again, to me even like with you got to get those things to work together in pairs. For instance, people talk about dorsiflexion of the foot. Well, you can dorsiflex the foot or the toes. Either one doesn't matter. But this is how it works out. How we operate in air or space is different than how we operate on the ground. So and that's like in the air, I can evert, invert, I can dorsiflex, plantar flex. I can do all, I can roll my ankle around, I can do all these things. I put my foot on the ground, I can't do those things anymore. So the foot can't do those things because the ground won't allow it. But then guess what can't do these things? The tibia. So all of a sudden, I say, okay, instead of pulling my foot up, you know, because it's on the ground, I'm still going to create the same action. But because the foot won't move up, guess what has to come forward now? The tibia. So, so you created this thing, but what do most people do? They try to plant flex off the ground, which makes the ankle loose. See, see, see. <laughs> It's like, which way am I going to go? Which way am I trying to roll this wheel? So at that point in time, we have to look at these things here where what I do in space is when I would, not what I do on the ground. So if you want this thing to be stiff, then you go, okay, if I pull this foot up or just flex the foot towards the shin, when it's on the ground, it will pull the shin towards the foot. Oh, there we go. I just locked up my ankle. It's stiff now. Yeah, trying to unpack... <laughs> I'm trying to pack that a little bit. So yeah, I definitely get that. Like what you're doing in the air is not what happens on the ground. And I think that a lot of times, I mean, as well as the fact that the the two feet that let's just say running or sprinting or whatever, like the two feet are in a constant interrelationship with each other. And I, the way I look at sprinting now is I think it's very easy just to almost like cut the body in half and just look at like a position on the front side of the body. And then, but it's like, okay, well, whatever's happening in the front, that foot and back is has a relationship with that. And then you also have the impact of the ground, <laughs> that collision to deal with in the equation. Right. right and right. so you get I, all it. maybe so I know that you were saying, okay, so the foot's the ground. The shin will roll. I know even before we hit record too, you're talking about um using the word roll more than if we talk about sagittal plane, like roll as an action. Like you talked about the you know, flow rather than something that's stagnant. Sagittal plane can be a stagnant position if you want it to be. So that you hit the foot hits the ground the shin or the tibia is rolling forward. But uh, could you expand on that a little bit more? Uh, maybe, I, maybe I just missed a few things when you were explaining that action on the ground. But maybe go back into that, the foot on the ground, the tibia rolling forward as it relates to motion and then points where there may need to be a level of uh, resisting deformity, I guess you could say. Resisting maybe is a better way of saying stiff. Maybe I like that more because it's, <laughs> it's an active thing. There is something that has to resist, right? There's an active force resisting something, but we also have to keep motion going. So I'm just curious on your well, relationship with that once the foot hits the ground. Well, it's kind of funny because, you know, I have a, I have a book that, that's in production and work should, hopefully comes out soon. And, and so one of, one of the three words we're using in this book and one of the chapters is, is stress, strain, and deformity. And so and, and stress could be anything, any, any type of force, you know, tensile force, shear force. You know, compression force, da da da. Any type, any type of force is stress. Now, what comes in that is the strain, and the strain is resistance to that force. The amount of strain you get will create a certain deformity or movement. So, so that's what we're dealing with. Where all of a sudden you get the the foot hitting the ground, right? That's a force. And so, what's the ground trying to do? Push the foot up. So, how do I resist that being pushed up? Well. I need a strain. What's the strain? The strain is going to be the change in the shit angle. That's the strain. That's the deformity. Gotcha. But now let's take it back a step further. There's not much deformity there because there's a lot of strain. There's a lot of resistance to that foot being pushed up. Now let's go back to like what we call a class one lever, where all of a sudden the Achilles is passive. Same force. Same amount of stress, but the strain is reduced. So what do you get? You get a lot of movement, a lot of deformity at the ankle. 
And so that's that's kind of how I engage in these things now. To stress the amount of strain and the amount of deformity I get. If I want a little bit of deformity, that means I need a lot of strain or resistance to this force, however much the force is. If I want a lot of deformity of movement, then guess what? I can't resist the force. So it's going to be a little bit of strain. And so, so that explains how we get these different moves throughout the body. For instance, the arm swinging forward. There's a stress on it, gravity. How much am I resisting that? Not much. What I get, I get a lot of deformity arm going back and forth. See what I'm saying? Yeah, the, yeah there's very little um, either stress or strain there. One of the two with the arm swing in there. Is it, would it be the, the st- stress because there's not, um, you know, there's not resistance there? Or there's, there's, there's very little resistance. Yeah, there's very little resistance being put up versus if I hold my arm straight out. Yeah. Gravity is still, the stress is still the same. But now the strain is greater to resist gravity pulling my arm down so it stays straight. See what I'm saying? And, it's, it is, and there's no deformity at this point in time because my arm's not moving. Versus if, I, if the stress is there and I relax my arm, take the, take the strain away, bloop, it'll fall. Now I get a whole lot of deformity, a whole lot of movement. So those are, those are the three things I look at it now is say how much stress is happening, how much strain do I want, to create how much deformity or movement do I want. And so in those two situations, class one lever, a whole lot of stress. Class two level, a whole lot of stress. What's the difference? The strain level. So the class one, low strain level, low resistance, a lot of movement at the ankle joint. Class two, high strain, a lot of resistance to the movement. So what I get? A little deformity, very little movement at the ankle joint. And I, I think that's what we have to say. Where do, I, where do I want the movement at? Do I want the movement at the ankle joint? No movement at the ankle joint. Not do I want it to be stiff, but do I want movement here or do I want movement there? Do I want movement at the elbow joint? Do I want movement at the hip joint? I want movement all these three joints. So where do I want movement at and where I don't want movement at? And based on that, stress, strain, deformity. I wanted to take a break from the show and briefly share with you the difference that performance herbalism can make for you. Several years ago, I had Logan Christopher, CEO of Lost Empire Herbs, on the show to talk about hypnosis and mental training for athletes. While talking to him, I realized he also had an herbalism company. So shortly thereafter, I used the Phoenix formula, which was my first product I bought from them. I had great results with it, not only increasing my energy and decreasing my need for coffee and caffeine, but I also noticed that it was making an impact on my lifts and my weight room numbers. I was having a great training experience. Shortly thereafter, I also got into the Shiliagit resin as well as other herbs. And I don't look at supplementation the same way. I'm a strong believer in what Logan and his company are doing in looking for a natural resource to boost human performance. If you want to check out the herbs that I use personally from Lost Empire Herbs, you can head to www.lostempireherbs.com slash just fly. There you can get 15% off your order and they offer a 365 day money back guarantee. Definitely check them out. Let's get on back to the show. Got it. So maybe we could talk about the strain on the ankle because you mentioned once I'm, once that foot hits the ground in running or jumping and that the the hips are passing over the foot and then the heel is going to start coming up off the ground and that fulcrum becomes the uh, the class two lever where the ball of the foot is the fulcrum so that and for right. people who haven't followed these podcasts or the lever systems i think that sometimes <laughs> it's it's nice to see a visual but just that that class one is if the heel the foot stays flat and the heel the shin is dropping forward over a flat foot you'd see that like a basketball player making a cut sometimes or yeah. move Oh you, then, oh, you see a lot of times when people are talking about they're testing the ankle mobility. Yeah, ankle mobility. Foot's flat yeah. on the ground, yeah. and they're pushing the knee towards the. They're pushing the knee towards that. See, see what I'm saying? Or a squat, yeah, a squat with the feet flat on the ground. Squat, thing. squat feet on the ground. There's very little strain in that system at that ankle. There's very little strain or resistance at the ankle joint to resist the movement. So you get a lot of deformity or a lot of flexion. Yeah, but then the strain, if people who operate like that, because I find, well, and then quickly too, the class two is when the heel is coming up and the knee is going forward and the, the toes stay on the ground. Like if you're doing a, right. I guess you could say, I mean, it's most present in sprinting, but maybe like a Hindu squat where the heels, you're letting the heels come up as you come back up. Although there might be some class one in there too, I'd imagine, but just trying to lay that definition out just for people who hadn't heard it. Right, uh, right. In right. a class one though, I mean, if someone's like kind of a class one dominant mover, like I... I ran a seminar in July. We were going through some vertical jumps and, you know, some of these, these coaches were, I find the younger athletes are oftentimes not, not always, but like children, you watch them, they're very class two dominant in the way that they can get to the ball, of the foot pretty well. And you get some, a lot of people who spend a lot of time squatting, especially, and you see a lot more class one dominance, even the vertical jump like that. They don't 
kick on to the ball of the foot in that upwards phase very quickly. A lot of times it's really late. Right. And then right. the strain needs to go somewhere else then. So, I mean, you would say that, what is your thoughts on that pass, the transmission of strain? If you're not going to strain at the foot, the heel stays flat a long time. I mean, then the knee or the, the hip's got to do more. It's, it's, so somebody, yeah, somebody, like I said, where, where, is this, where is this movement going to go to? That's like, you know, when somebody, you know, let's take, you know, somebody jumping off a wall. Let's take a parkour guy jumping off a wall. There is a lot of force. There's very little strain. Mm. As we see the ankle, knee, hip, everybody just deforms or moves. Because if, 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 if there's a lot of strain or resistance to that ground pushing up, you're going to be broke. I got you. Okay, got it. Uh, before you go any further, actually, that just clicked on. So basically, this is my, maybe my terminology too, but a low resistance movement, like jumping into a wall, so laterally, where there's not gravity 9.8 pushing you down, but you still deform. Like deforming against right. not a lot of resistance, that is a lot of stress, but little strain. But if I right. jumped off a six foot curve onto the ground, now there's going to be a lot of strain because there's something that has to push me back up. Unless I guess I just let my body like just fold up, like sometimes those parkour core guys do. Yeah, if you, it, yeah. If you let it fold up, no strain, a lot of deformity because that's the little the strain is the resistance to the force. And so at that point in time, if you just jumped off a thirty foot wall and hit the ground, how much strain, how much resistance you going to put out there to stop your body from collapsing down? Ah, no, you got to, yeah. you got to, you got to, it's very little strength, <laughs> very little resistance. So you get a lot of deformity and the body folds up to handle what's about to happen. Cool. Yeah. I think that's a good point because, okay, that lends to where I think this could go to quite naturally is the question then is that balance of how much strain do you need to be a fast accelerator, to be a fast sprinter? Because there's obviously... A level of deformity, right? And there's, right. especially you get up in the top end speed and you look at how fast that shin is changing directions and angles, right. the angular velocity of the shin from ground strike to that delayed knee extension to, it's really fast and a lot of stress uh, versus the acceleration where it's actually, uh, it is dropping, but it's not as much. And you think there'd be more strain that has to push back in that situation. So I'm just curious how you would see those <laughs> no, two. But, but see, you just summed it up very well. Oh, well, you know, yeah, accidentally. Because yeah. no, no, this is the funny thing. And it's like they say, yeah. <clears throat> because they say at top end, you know, they're putting out more. You know, they're putting out more strain to resist more. Because, yeah, the impact is higher. Versus an acceleration, what are you doing? You put out less because the force is less, you know? But what do I need to do at the start versus when I'm at top end? To start, things have to fold up, you know. Yeah. And, and at, at top end, things don't have to fold up as much. So, so we get to these things there. But the biggest thing is this here: is if I'm at coming out of blocks or you know two point stance, three point stance, whatever the case may be, the first thing I got to do is I got to get to a class two lever. The whole thing about it is it's not going to take that much strain to resist that amount of force because it's not that much force yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, you know what I'm saying? saying? Not as much the, rotational. The rotational the, the, force not, yeah, is, the rotation is, is not It's not really so there much. yet. Yeah. So, so I don't need it. And so that's what we keep talking about once again. When people talk about <clears> you need <throat> a lot of force to start. No, you don't. There's not much there to start with in the first place. <laughs> There's is not much there. So I don't have to put up much resistance or much strain to get moving. Yeah. You know? Because there's not going to be much deformity either. You know, so, so But once I get going, then as the stress level goes up, from the impact, the strain needs to go up from the impact to resist. So I don't collapse. And that's like, even like I was talking about in triple jump. Once again, we got these variations going on. And I was saying, and, and you know, I always had these conversations where I'm like, at the ankle, there's two ways to work this in triple jump. And the better triple jumpers have a whole lot of resistance at the ankle joint, not a lot of resistance at the hip joint. The not so good triple jumpers have a whole lot of resistance in reverse ways. There's a whole lot of resistance at the hip joint, not a whole lot of resistance at the ankle joint. And that hip is going to drop two ways. Either it's dropping because it's colliding into the body or it's dropping because the shin angle is changing. And so you get into these things now, once again, where do I want the movement at? So if I'm triple jumping or something like that, or even high jumping, if I'm high jumping, where do I want movement at? Well, I want movement at the knee joint through the hip joint. I want the, I want the ankle joint you know, yeah. Oh, if yeah. I'm long jumping, where do I want the movement at? So, mm-hmm. so, so it becomes two things. Where do I want the movement at? At what joint do I want movement at? And based on that, I'm going to create a level of strain to either allow it to move, deform, or not allow it 
to move or deform, you know? And so I think that's what, that's what we get into. But then that's what, you know, like I said, nobody's training that way because yeah. nobody's really factoring their joints. Everybody's, everybody's, you know, nobody's really like, either I want a lot of movement at this joint or I don't want a lot of movement at this joint. And so at that point in time, you know, like I said, we're back to the foot. Well, how do I do this? Well, heck, if I try to pull up the foot or dorsal flex the foot as the shin's coming forward, huh, I'm resisting. Because what is the shin doing? The shin's trying to come forward as the ground's trying to push the foot up. So now we got resistance going on. Now we got now we got some strain going on. Now I can take that strain and move it up the system. If it doesn't, if it, it so what's going to happen? If I don't move at another joint, now it's going to move me forward and keep the wheel rolling. Yeah, I, I'd like to get into that that back half of things here uh, in a minute. I want to go. There's a few wheels turning. Wheels, <laughs> uh, not a, a pun <laughs> pun intended. A few wheels turning in my head that I, I wanted to get your take on. So. This is just how I'm seeing this right now. Uh, you know, sprint acceleration, for example, you're, you're overcoming. Yeah. You have to overcome dead stop inertia. And and the way I'm looking at you talk about stress and strain, especially the lower legs, is I'm kind of the, I'm seeing that in the vertical vector. If that makes sense, in acceleration, like low. Uh, and you know, I, I think people argue about vertical and horizontal, but I'm I'm just looking at it from vertical roll of gravity because I I will say like there's I mean. Angus uh, Ross was on a while ago talking about, and this isn't everybody, but like he had a good, interesting example of a guy who, and just on like the force play, uh, reactive strength, like single leg hopping type test, this guy did relatively poorly, but had massive, a massive horsepower, just general strength, like standing vertical type stuff, stuff where it was slightly longer contacts. He crushed it and he was an amazing accelerator, dropped off on top end speed. So once he got up and running and that wheel got bigger and the collisions got more impactful, but I'm almost looking at that, um, the stress and the strain. So acceleration, low, sorry, low strain acceleration being more in the vertical because the wheels aren't going. And then in the top end, higher strain. And uh, on the lower leg, though, is where I'm seeing that. But the acceleration, maybe there's more strain up in like the knee and the hip joint. Uh, and it's maybe do more horizontal strain in nature, if that makes sense. And then top end, you could probably have a variety of things going on, but just from the lower leg. Seems like uh, that. Let, you, let me know what you think about that. Yeah, just, yeah, I'm yeah. No, to that, that, together. I mean, because that that works like so like I said, we <clears> go back to basic levers, we have these two things going on, perpendicular and parallel. Perpendicular is the vertical, parallel is the horizontal. I need both of those. The greater the perpendicular, the greater parallel can be. And, and so when people are and to me, like once again, if people argue about you know vertical and horizontal, but you gotta think about it this way here. When you look at the when you look at the 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 the, the, the Kim, not the Kim, but the physics book and they talk about vertical and horizontal. They talk about somebody pushing a box. Yeah. And the horizontal is the friction. It's the friction. If the box is floating, the vertical is still there. You know what I'm saying? The, if, the, if the box is not on the ground, how much horizontal do you have? Zero. Mm. Why? There's no friction. We got to deal with the same thing. I need this vertical to create this friction, which is the horizontal. Without that friction, without that horizontal, your foot's going to slip out from underneath you. Yeah. It's like, it's like the same thing. It's like when you're trying to use a crowbar and it slips, you can't, the vertical, the, the vertical downward is not enough to hold it in place. So it slips when you put the parallel on it. We're in the same boat. So that's where I think people mix this up at. I need this vertical perpendicular to create this friction, which is the horizontal. Once I get that friction or horizontal, the wheel can spin. I don't want the wheel to slip. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's where last podcast we, we talked about like, um, you know, like it's like a, if I have a lever or if I have like, um, I'm trying to, this is going to show how bad my reference to tools is with how like how much <laughs> I work on like house projects or car, but like if I had a long, yeah. like a long ratchet, like I need that, that ratchet to be solid enough to grab the bolt so I can then that, that being like the vertical force so that I can then turn the lever, the lever can turn over that. Or if the, you can think of the, Right. Well, the foot is the base of the ratchet that has to be driven down by gravity enough to meet the frictional demand to then throw the um the the, the shin over the top right. or even i know when we i was um you know it's funny everyone just you know someone had a post on how like you know as soon as uh, you could do all these posts on sprinting but as soon as someone takes their you know shoes off and starts sprinting, everyone just goes nuts and it's like but you're uh, you, I, we were, I was sprinting barefoot on the track in berkeley and you were talking about it from a frictional level and i'd never thought about it that way because it's like I could run relative, if I ran a 30 barefoot on a track, I could run relatively close to the fastest I could run with shoes on, but not as fast. Right. And right. you had mentioned it was a frictional issue. And I was like, what do you mean? And you were saying like, well, if you, 
if your brain put full power into that downward motion, you'd rip your skin, you know, and your brain doesn't want you to rip the skin on your foot. So it's going to downregulate that. And then you actually can't lever off of it as hard. And I was like, oh, oh, that's that makes sense. And, you know, I, I'd always that was always in my head when I'd run barefoot. Now, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. If you try to run on banana peels, it ain't, it's not going to well, the friction's not there. <laughs> run on banana so, peels or accelerate on the ice. <laughs> right, 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 right. What it, accelerate on the ice? What do you got to create? You got to create the friction. What it, you know? So I think that's what people, you know, they, and so that's why, you know, even like people say that the, the, the shit angle is the horizontal. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Because what's going to happen is this here. The foot locks down and then I roll into this class two thing. And as that happens, the shin is changing directions, changing angles. Yes, it is, you know. But at the same time, my hip is still behind the shin. So if that was the case, what am I waiting on now? I'm waiting on my hip to get in position. Now, if the hip stays behind that tibia and you leave the ground, what's going to happen? You're going to do a backflip. So it's not creating a horizontal. See what I'm saying? You're going to create, you're going to do a backflip. If you try to, if you try to lead the ground with the shin pointing in one direction, hips behind you, that becomes a backflip. I was trying to. I'm trying to put that together. So if you're saying if you're you're t- you're sprinting and you're towing off, and the ball of the foot is behind the hip, and the you know the, the, obviously the shin is rolled forward. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to put that together. You may have to. You may have to <laughs> well, phrase that okay, that way for me. Think, think about this. Think about back to dances, mm-hmm. break dance, and all those kinds of things where they do the single leg flip overs with the kick. Which way is the shin going? One way. Which way is the hip going? It's behind the shin. And what do they do? They flip backwards. They don't go forward. So the shin is not creating the horizontal. That's the, that's the whole thing about it. it it's, it's, it's not creating horizontal because if the hip is behind the shin, as the shin's angled forward, you will do a backflip if you left the ground. I think I know what you're saying. It, it, that would be the point where the foot, where is the, in that example, where is the foot in relation to the hip in space? Right. And so just because the shin's pointing one way, but the hip and foot is in different opposite areas, you're going to do a backflip. So it's, it, it's not, and that, so people said the shin points this way. That means I'm going horizontal. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Don't 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 base horizontal on the shin, because horizontal is friction. Got it. So yeah, so is that what you're saying? In your opinion, then is that what creates the horizontal force in a, a sprint, or what? Where do you feel like that comes from, like the horizontal component, or is that even really worth talking about in your opinion? Well, no, like I said, the horizontal component, the friction component, is coming from the vertical component. The more you press down, it. the more friction you get. I got it. The more friction I get. But, but once again, that allows me to dictate which direction I want to go. It doesn't indicate the direction I want to go. It allows me to dictate which way I want to go. I, I, I can do a back flip. I can do a forward flip. I can go straight up and down based on that. Got it. That, that makes sense to me based off of um, the research showing that like track and field sprinters, as opposed to a, like a team sport athlete sprinting as fast as they can, that track and field sprinter has at the very instant a touchdown has a higher breaking force a higher vertical spike in force and that would make sense with that vertical to horizontal i get a higher vertical spike not through the whole thing but just at that beginning like that's that ratchet latching on to the bolt strongly so then i can do what i want with it that would be would that be a good way of putting it yeah same with the same way with the ratchet it's like you know you got to lock down and then you can decide which way you want to push or pull it the, the, the angle of the shin is indicator of which way the parallel is going. Which way, which way, which way is, is, am I trying to move? It's not the indication of the horizontal. It's the indication of which way am I trying to move? Yeah, you I mean, know, just it's, like it's a vector. At, it's, you're saying it's a vector more than a force. Like if that shin is going to, it's going to roll or drop. And eventually, like when the hip, the, when the hip is right over the knee, that shin should be pointing backwards. That vector should be backwards or at least indicate a horizontal direction of travel. You're just saying that that's not the force, that's not the force portion so much. That's not, yeah, that's not, you know, even like, you know, like say, if you look at, what's the name? Uh, Rojas, triple jump. Yeah. Amazing, amazing triple jumper. And so even like this here, on one of her legs, when she lands in the class two level, which is what we call her go up leg. You know, the hip is already in front of the foot. So, so by the time that toe comes off the ground, that's actually going to put her flat versus if I'm high jumping, what's happening? When the foot wants to come off the ground, the hip and knee and ankle are in line. That makes me go vertical. See what I'm saying? Mm. Where's the hip at 
at the point in time when the foot comes off the ground will dictate which way you're about to go. And so, and so you look at her on the other leg, we call it go down leg, which is a class one, class yeah, two class lever. One, yeah. The hip stays behind the foot, which keeps her once again flat until uh, this, this, okay, put it this way here. Everybody's talking about Sydney in the 400 hurdles, right? And this is what they miss. This is what they miss on. We watch her and you watch Muhammad. This whole thing about it. Muhammad goes flat over the hurdles. Yeah, Sydney seems Sydney, to go a little higher. Yeah. She goes vertical. So she's changing from this from this flat run. So she gets to the hurdle. She goes vertical, comes back down, flat out. Muhammad is flat, 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 flat. She never goes vertical. So what's happening? And that's the amazing part people miss about Sydney is that that control right there, that stress strain deformity, that she switched up to go over the hurdle. And then she switched back after the hurdle to a whole different system. It's amazing. It's it's just being dynamic, yeah. It's like it's it's it's, 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 it's an amazing, right? And that's what makes her what she is. You know, is because she has this really good control over those three things: the stress, the strain, and the deformity. I mean, think about that. We come to a hurdle. What we tell people to do just go over the damn thing. Yeah, I. She I'm, is switching up to a vertical movement pattern, <laughs> comes down and flattens out again. Yeah. That's where that um, just like a high to long bounding sequence or even in you know triple jump, you're the first person to key me into like, oh, hey, these world record triple jumps aren't just flat, flat, flat. I mean, I think like Mike Conley was close to that back in the day, but Jonathan Edwards wasn't, you know, the, right. uh, what's the, the female, the former female world record holder definitely wasn't not even close. Yeah. A lot of the top jumps are that high to right. flat to high. I mean, it's not like not like long jump high, but I mean, it is a, that waveform is definitively there. <laughs> and right, um, right, it's right. like, even if you just bound like that kind of, Hey, go bound long high. It feels pretty good. I was like, yeah, it feels kind of like natural and normal and more like I'm working with what my body wants to do. You know, it just, you feel so, it. Yeah. It's very interesting. Well, I, well, yeah, I think at that point in time, like I said, same thing, we can use bounding, you know, that's what we should be using bounding for to gain control of these, these things. Do I want to go vertical? Do I want to go more forward? And that, and that, that's probably a, a you know, how forward to vertical or how forward to up are we getting and, and where's the meat at? I think those are better words than, than saying, you know, a horizontal force or a vertical force, things like that, because I'm, I'm trying to give myself a direction way to go. And I got to, I got, it's got to match up right. Just like Sydney found a good matchup. I'm going forward, forward, forward. Now I'm going up and forward. I'm going forward, forward, forward. Now I'm going up and forward. And same thing with Roja. She's found a good balance between up and forward. We see, like I said, some triple jumpers are bad because all it is is what? Forward, forward, forward. No up. Some other triples are bad because it's what? It's up, up, up. Yeah, yeah that's bad too, obviously. Yeah, that's right, not going to work right, very well right. for you so, either. So, I, so, so these guys have found out that that mixture based on this thing of where do I want movement at and which joint do I want movement at? Because like I said, at this point in time, Rojas, where's the movement at? The movement's at the hip joint. And you look at some of the lesser tri- female triple jumps, where's the movement at? It moves at the ankle joint. So at that point in time, you go, okay. The lesser female triple jumpers have same amount. I mean, you gotta think about it. They have the same amount of force that they're dealing with as Rojas is dealing with, in a sense. Yeah, the strain coming up from the ground is the same. I mean, they're not maybe not quite as high because they're not jumping as far, but I mean, it's, it's right, close. right, right, it's right. Close. But 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 at that point in time, once they hit the ground, then you go her ability to resist or create that strain at the ankle and take it at the hip. See see how that works out. Versus the rest of them are creating high resistance at the hip. And giving up the ankle. Got it. So you're saying that the, the elite. Tri- I, I got to play that back in my mind again. You're saying the elite triple jumpers, the the, the higher tier, they have more. Um, maybe I'll just say in terms of movement, they have. And obviously, in that second phase, there's usually more movement at the ankle, anyways, because you have to yield. But they have. They generally have more or less movement at the ankle than the lower. Like who has? It, yeah. As you see, who has more movement in the ankle? The the lower, or the higher. Right, and who has more? Who has more or less movement at the hip? See, you, you got you like I said. Where am I going to place this boot? I got to place this. I got to place the deformity somewhere. I got to put like yeah, it has, yeah. Something has to I, deform. I, I, yeah. Some, some got to deform. <laughs> some, some, you know. And so we look at it that way. But at the same time, same thing with high jump and everything like that. You know, sprinting coming out of sprint start. You know, and that's why you know, like I said, when I talk about about the back leg, I want this back leg to hold up now. You know, especially once I get into the position where the hips on top of the knee and, and the wheels rolling forward. 
I want the ankle to hold up. I want the knee to hold up. I want the hip to hold up. I want all these three joints now. I don't want no movement at them anymore. But where do I want movement at? Huh, I want to have to toe now at the MTP joints. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Somebody has to deform. <laughs> yeah, I think that's important because, yeah, that's going back to if it's, if it's just the general form of stiffness. Hey, I want you to be stiffer off the ground. That's as if like nothing is going to deform, you know, or, <laughs> right, or right, everything right, right. is <laughs> everything is minimally deforming. Uh, but OK, so let me but let me pose you this question. An athlete who let's just say you have an athlete who they have a good standing vertical jump, a good counter movement jump, or, or maybe they like do a they're a basketball player and they, they squat down really far to do a standing vertical, but they're not as good at being really quick off the ground. You know, they can't get right. up quickly to block shot or whatever. So this right. very, you know, very concrete, like this is a typical situation. What's your take on how to look at training that athlete under the stress, strain, deformity terms? And what are you, what are you looking for in terms of intervent or inter- interventioning? What's your, inter- <laughs> what's your intervention there, Darian? Well, I think you, you know, I was talking to somebody about this just the other day and, and let's put these guys in different categories. You know, for instance, I would call those guys chest jumpers. If you look like a volleyball player, you know, if I, if, you know, somebody has to float, I would call them like bird, you know, barrel chest people because the jump is coming through the chest. They're trying to raise their chest up, which is why they're folding down so much because it's going to go through the chest. And that's what we see like with, with volleyball players. We see all of a sudden that the chest rises up and the arms split apart, so forth and so forth, you know. And then we see other guys, you know, like for me, why am I poor at volleyball? Because I can't jump through my chest. But. Legs, I'm up quick, but I get up quick. What can I do now? Because I didn't use my chest. I can't hit the ball. So, so see how these things start working out? And you have some people that what I would call going through the chest. And you see a lot of those guys, especially in kind of movement jumpers. Those guys did really good. It's coming from the chest being rised up. So where's the deformity at? There's a little resistance in the legs. But now I need a lot of resistance in the upper body and the chest so I can rise up through this thing. So I put those guys in different categories in a sense. And so that guy that squats down a lot, because like me, I was I, I could get up, but I couldn't squat down a whole lot. Mm. And so you see guys that don't squat down very much, boom, get up. But but you see other guys that squat down a lot don't get up as fast because they're going through a different area, the chest. So you see the deformity is in the legs and the resistance or little deformity is in the chest. Gosh, I know when I was doing my, I could see that like a volleyball player versus uh, maybe more of the type of jumper you were at in the sense of um, right. my master's thesis was on a, like a depth jump and only it was a low box. It was like 45 centimeters, 18 inches and athletes would jump off of it, hit the force plates and they would either jump up and touch um, a vertex or they would jump right. over a hurdle or they would just jump in space and then have a constraint at all. And, right. uh, the, the longer I've been doing this, the more important that I, it's because I realize it is to have something to react to. But uh, what I found was that if you jumped up to touch something, it was a very different style of jump. There was the joints out, acted a lot differently. Your knees actually bent a lot more and took more of the, the force, <laughs> like you know, the way that we calculated it. Yeah. That's where the deformity was versus if you, um, if you were jumping over the hurdle, actually, you actually nothing, um, the total deformity in all joints was less actually, because you right. would just get, and probably too, I would imagine you weren't using your chest as much either in that situation you weren't trying to i I look at it too of like trying to increase that last little height of your center of mass before you leave the ground you can get your shoulders and chest up a little higher too i imagine that might you know help before those feet touch our toe off so i imagine that might have something as well to do with it and even look at it this way you know i mean because think about it what's a volleyball player been doing since day one they've been working on pulling up a chest to jump pull up a chest to jump so got a lot of reps at it and what have, what have we done? We have never taken volleyball players and converted them to track and field athletes. We've never taken a volleyball player and said, hey, you should be a good high jumper. Hey, you might be a good triple jumper. Hey, you might be a good long jumper. <laughs> we haven't done that. Yeah. But they got great verticals. They got, they got great jumping ability. But we have never taken those guys. But we've taken basketball players and said, hey, come over this way. Hey, you're going to be a good long jumper. Hey, you'll be, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they, they jump off the run more too. But uh, well, here's something I would, tell me what you think about this. I, I think this is interesting is I know that High jumpers, like Dick Fosbury, you saw this, is he doesn't use his arms very much. Like his arms kind of stay down at his right. sides for a really long time in that jump. Whereas a lot of you know, people instruct you to get your arms up higher, raise your center mass, whatever. He didn't do it. There's other high jumpers that don't do it. I mean, there's a lot that typically do, but I've been really intrigued with the idea of doing uh, like John Garris was just on to, um, talking about skips and gallops. And I think this might be a part that people can really play around with this variable and see how it changes things. But 
I have a lot of people I work with who I say, hey, all right, just go skip. <laughs> you know, I, I like just that's yeah. an assessment, huge assessment, just go skip. And they'll, they're really overusing their arms and shoulders and chest to try to get up. And right, the constraint right, I'll do right. is, hey, I want you to skip and your arms aren't allowed to get higher than like your chest or your waist. <laughs> or I mean, right. maybe not your waist, but like they have to stay low. And that changes everything because it makes your impulses and relationship with the ground way different. And I, I view that as almost as per what you're talking about, a way to, like, if I was going to take a volleyball player and try to make them a track jumper, I would do constraints to make them do like a ton of skipping with those hands down, you know, like, <laughs> like let's make your feet do something, you know, like that very right, general way right. of putting it. But Right, right, right. And so I think that's, to me, that's why I would put classmates in the jumpers or you, are, you know, like I say, a chest jumper or your leg jumper. And, and so to me, they're like in different categories and stuff. But I, I think that, you know, because. Like I said, we look at the volleyball players and they get up really well. I mean, they, these yeah. guys can get up, you know, oh, yeah. but they haven't done the traditional training that, that other people have done. They haven't done the, the weight lifting. They haven't done this. They have, they just worked on just jumping their whole life. But I, I've yet to see a volleyball player, even at the high school level, even those guys are jumping well, you know, they, you know, even you, you see some of the good high school volleyball, they jump well, they can dunk basketballs. They can do, you know, but like I said, we've never taken those guys. Hey, come over here to track and field. Let's see, you know, let's see if you can high jump. But you got to remember with high jump too. Remember, high jump was with, when you got to remember, Flaws Bay converted from Western Roll to the flop. And the roll is a leg, it's, it's all legs. It is, there's, no, there's no arms in a roll. You, you, yeah. don't, you don't drive your arms up and then you, it's just, it's just so, so I think that's part of it too. When you look at why he probably doesn't use his arms, because when he converted over, arms weren't being used. I was horrible at the roll, by the way, like compared to my, my, my flop was like seven feet and my roll yeah. was like, I don't know, like five, eight, maybe like yeah. oh, five, six. Yeah. It was really bad. And I was, I would use my arms a lot, <laughs> like wait, so, yeah. probably too much to be honest. When I jumped seven feet, I, I was actually having a quicker, more abrupt motion of my arms, not like low, but they were high, but it was a, I wasn't doing the big swing, you know? And yeah. And I just, oh man, I was always so bad at that role, um, the, the Western role. I, I don't want to make it too much. I don't want to make this too much, especially the high jump. So just kind of back to that, that, that quickness thing. I mean, so an athlete who, yeah, isn't quick off the ground, needs to get quicker off the ground. And, and even, yeah, volleyball jump too is you have a longer time to set up. I, I set up. You have a long so time. Long to, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is, so there is, you know, we've, we've done shows talking about like, yeah, like the, the, the pelvic floor balance and the different infrasternal angles and how that plays into it. But from the scope of this conversation, I mean, do you feel like a good intervention is, I mean, yeah, just go out and doing like track style jump, sure, throwing more velocity on it. But what do you think like the idea of the, the skipping and just limiting arm, maybe putting a constraint where they can't use their arms that way? They have to generate quick ground skips and gallops and contacts where they're, they're less able to use that or uh, could yeah, you? Yeah, I, I mean, even yesterday, uh, John was at my house. He came out to the ranch from Florida and stuff. And, and so one of the things, one of the workouts he did was he had to do a single leg skip with a 40 pound bag on his shoulder and he got to go 40 yards. So he goes 40 yards one way, comes back the other way on the other leg. And then after that, we go jump and duck on the basketball rim because that the skip initiates that whole process. So, yeah. so yeah, you can do that. You know, and all of a sudden he, when he first did it, you know, it was like, Oh, and then all of a sudden he figured it out. Then he became faster at it. And then he came, then all of, you know, when he first started, he was backing up like, you know, 10 feet from the basket. Then all of a sudden he's standing in front of the basket, little skip, boom, dunk it. So, so yeah, I, I think that would work very well because for them, they don't really, you know, like I said, feet is just kind of there for them, you know? And so for a lot of people, just like somebody on Instagram had mentioned me, I got to look him up. But anyways, he, he's, he's a golfer and he's, and, he, and I watched his swing. And I sent him a DM saying, hey, watch this guy here who's really good. Watch how active his feet are. Versus when you swing the club, your feet don't do anything. So once again, if I'm swinging this club, what can I do? Huh. If I pull my feet up, I just created stress on the system. So how's the system going to handle the strain now? Oh, the deformity is arm swinging down, pulling the club down. See how that works? Hmm. If I pull my feet up, that's a stress on the system. I got a strain now. Where's the strain at? Oh, whoop, pull the club head down. Gotcha. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting to apply this to all sorts of different movements. I, you know, I, I've had a few more. I'm trying to think. Okay, I had. Uh, okay, here's where I was going to go with that. So there's the jumping element. And I was going to say, too, with the sandbag, it's like a sandbag on your shoulder pushes that side down. It's like if you had a, a chest-based strategy, it actually, it's, 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 
creating stress, uh, compression yeah. on that chest usually would expand. So it, and I, you know, the way I've been thinking about things, it's just so much more and more. And like, you know, humans are a more complex creature than an animal. And I feel like as such, we actually have more strategies. Like, I think if you asked, if you ask, like, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't trained animals enough to see this, but if you ask like a horse to gallop or run or, or, a, or do jumping in a horse show, I'd imagine that there's less strategies that animals use to accomplish tasks than humans. Like you have speed jumpers, power jumpers, like flop style jumpers. You have different, we just do things in more ways and even like acceleration. You have people that are more linear. You have people that are more rotational. You have, you have like strat. we have different strategies. And I think that yeah, we generalize so much, but sometimes I feel like, well, should we just learn, like, shouldn't you just teach athletes both strategies and then see how they can ultimately I mean, I guess the further you get into like track and field events, you know, there's more guidance, but just giving even younger athletes to say, hey, here's this strategy, go run. Here's this strategy, go run. Here's this strategy, go jump, you know, see how your body and takes it and use it. I'd rather you be able to do all these, you know, than just have one <laughs> than I just teach yeah, you one yeah. way this whole time. And so right, I just think right, that's an interesting right. way of putting it with the chest strategy. I didn't, I saw the sandbag video. I didn't, I wasn't thinking of it from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So all of a sudden, once again, I have the stress on the side. And now what, what's happening at the chest level? Well, it's, it's, it's straining. It's going to put a lot of resistance up because it wants to hold its position now. <laughs> you know, it's not going to deform. It's going to hold its position. Mm-hmm. So who, who, who now is taking the deform? Where's the movement coming at? Well, it's coming where I want it at. It's coming at the ankle joints, it's coming at the, the MTP joints. It's coming where, I, you know, so that's, that's what's going to deform for me. But the rest of the knee up, strain, resistance. You know, something that's funny. So I, I want to bring this to sprinting because I think, you know, well, everyone loves sprinting. <laughs> yeah, that's part of this <laughs> podcast exists. Um, so, but what's interesting, like, like to bring this into a sprint specific um, equation, because obviously people would ask, all right, well, hey, how do I, how do I achieve better uh, let's say resistance to deformity uh, relative to the sprint cycle? <laughs> or I don't like to use, you know, yeah. stiffness, we have the cast. Yeah. But uh, well, yeah. one thing I wanted to get your take on too, because this is interesting is, People, a lot of people would say, well, straight leg bounding because you have this big straight leg coming down, right? And uh, granted, you can only straight leg bounce so fast to get, and it's not even a wheel, really. It's more like two like kind of scissoring feet going back and forth. So you kind of lose that. But I noticed that when a lot of athletes do straight leg bounding, what happens as per our conversation is where's the deformity? It's actually in the ankle <laughs> and big time. Like watch straight leg bounding. And watch what happens to the ankle. And that See, thing mushes but, like a pancake behind the athletes all the time. It's, it's kind of hilarious. But, but I should put this to show notes. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the whole point. It, 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 can't put up enough, it can't put up enough strength to resist that force. So it deforms. And you can't bend the knee. You're, you're not. I mean, you do actually end up bending the knee once... It right. is actually funny because you but, have to bend something. And some, what ends up is the, the ankle and the knee end up both bending as soon as it gets on the hip. It's pretty funny. Yeah. I find that humorous. Uh, I mean, not. I've actually been, I, I'm not totally dismissive of straight leg bounding. I think you can work it and use it in w- different ways. I think any tool is as good as how you use it. But use it. Right, I just right, I do right, find right, that kind of humorous. Right. But but yeah, if I'm doing a straight leg bound, guess where my deformity is coming at? at the hip. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the hip take that blow. Because at the same time, when I'm sprinting, I want the I'm, I'll make the hip take the blow because I don't want the movement at the knee joint or the ankle joint. I so so once the, so see what I'm saying? Where am I gonna control how am I gonna control the movement at these joints? And that's what I'm saying. We move at joints. Joints don't move. We move at a joint. The only way the joint can move is the whole body moves with it. But it doesn't, it doesn't go, oh, let me let me just move 10 degrees to the left. They're gonna do that. So I think that becomes part of it. And even like I said, in a sprinting mode, you know, one thing about sprinting is once again. You know, people talk about run tall, but you can't run tall. You're already bent in a sense, which sets up the amount of strain you're about to put into the to the stress that you're about to encounter. And that's the part people miss out on. The body's kind of pre-set up like, oh, this is what we're about to do. Because it only knows what happened last time. So based on what happened last time, it's going, okay, let's set up for this. Okay, we got a little bit more. Okay, let's set up for this. It only knows what happened last time. The new next event is a new event. You, you're going to get a little bit more, but it's only set up for last time. So, so in that sense there, the body's going to preset the strain based on the resistance it thinks it's about to, or the stress levels thinks it's about the encounter. Yeah, the way I am seeing that as you described it is, so let's just take the average sprint stride. You know, the legs straightening out in the front side, it's, it's coming down towards the ground as the rear leg is coming back up, as the wheel action, the legs are related to each other. So the leg hits the ground slightly in front of the hips. There is going to be deformity at that point. And... It's kind of like the deformity happens with 
it's almost like the chain of deformity is so it can get shot up into the hip. Like you're saying, like, so the hip can really rotate and project. And as the hip goes, I'm trying to like, you know, I'm trying to always be thinking, okay, if I was listening to this, how could I describe it so it, you know, I could understand this. But basically, <laughs> as, as the hip is moving over the foot, you're going to get some bend in the knee, some bend in the ankle. But then as soon as the hip gets over the ankle, that heel is going to start coming up. It's going to start right. that process. And it's almost like that process of the heel coming up is so that there's actually less deformity at the foot and ankle and kind of knee in that sense of right. how the heel is going with the knee because the heel goes up with the knee coming forward. Right. That to you, that is the mechanism that allows that to shoot up into the hip so that the hip can take it and work with that other swing leg, basically. Is that kind of what you're, I'm thinking, is that, is that what the picture that you have is? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it is, you know. And, and so it becomes, like I said, I, I have the stress. I got this strain. The strain is how I'm going to resist this, this stress. And, and like I said, we also, oftentimes we think about, you know, once again, we think about this one type of force. But we got many forces on us when we hit the ground. You know, we got this rotational thing. We got this impact thing. We got this tensional thing. We got this shear thing. We got all these compressive things. We got all these. And that's what people do. We got all it's an these orchestra. stresses. It's an orchestra going on, of stress. And I, I only got one way to resist it. <laughs> I got yeah, one Just one mechanism. general. Yeah, just, <laughs> just put force to the ground. Just be stiff. Um, yeah. So, but okay, maybe this is a good like example that we can really put this to work. So, the straight leg bound versus, I mean, this is one of the things where that kind of lined me up to the point where as soon as I heard about squatty running from you, I'm like, yep. Like, and, and, you know, not like I'm going to go out and sprint, like squat down a foot and sprint or something like that. Or I mean, and when I sprint, I, I, it's more like reacting and feeling. I'm not actually thinking of my hips being a particular height, but as an exercise tool, like a flex leg bound, I, as soon as I did this is, and the flex leg bound is what led me into the effectiveness of squatty running for these mechanisms. And we could even talk about how squatty running works with these deformities putting into the hip. Right. Cause I feel like squatty right. running is even more like allowing your hips to really work, but like a flex leg bound, if you do a straight leg bound, so anyone listening to this, do a straight leg bound, then go do a flex leg bound. What do you feel working like crazy? Your hip in the flex leg bound is just like, it's like hit, hit, hit. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this is kind of, you know, this flex leg bound is a lot more what fast sprinting feels like than this straight leg bound. And I'm like, huh. And so anyways, talk about how those differences are like with a flex leg versus a straight and what's deforming and what's straining and then what's ultimately where you're getting well, the deformity. Well, this, well, this is the funny part. So, so I'm going to bring up bricks, you know, because people have been, some people like it, some people don't like it. Some people, people that don't like it haven't tried them, you know, but yeah. every, anybody that's tried the bricks, they love the bricks. And this where this comes in at. This is the whole thing about it. When you step on the brick, this, and this is, this is how easy it gets. You step on the brick, you just encounter the force. And so the brick, like I say, when you stand on the ground, it's you in the ground. 500 pounds going down, 500 pounds coming up, mm. zero. Nothing's going to move. You need to imbalance someplace. So when you step yeah. on the brick, where's the weight at? On the backside of the foot. So what's the brick going to do? It's going to push the foot up. So now, what do I do? I got to create a resistance or a strain someplace so my heel doesn't drop. Now, if I'm straight-legged, guess what? It's very hard to create that resistance. Very hard to create that resistance because there's just too much weight on this, on this very short lever that, you know, you're standing on, you know, if your foot is six inches long, you got two inches on one part, you got four inches on the backside, it's very hard. So at that point in time, once again, I got to create the formula up the chain someplace mm. to help with this resistance. And so, and so that, was, that, was the, that, was, that was the brick does. So then when you get off the brick, that's what I tell people, because the brick, the foot's being pushed up, you learn how to counter that stress. You know what resistance, well, how much strain you need to counter that stress. So when you get off the brick, what do you know already? Hmm. How to counter that stress. And so then what you do is you do it yourself. So now when it's time for me to run, what must I do? I'm going to create the stress myself. I'm going to create the stress myself. Do what the brick did. I'm going to pull the foot up. The brick pushed it up. I'm going to pull it up now. So what must I do now? I already know how to counter this because I've been doing it on the brick. So I'm going to create the strain to counter it now I roll forward. That, that's the beauty of it. So that's the difference between straight leg and bent leg is that if you straight leg, it's very hard to create enough resistance, enough strain to counter or resist the force because you are, you're like, there's no deformity coming. 
it, you need some deformity. Yeah, I think a good experiment. I'm my my mind's always thinking like, oh, here's an experiment to try. You know, to experience this. Like we you yeah. have the straight leg bound, we have the flex leg bound is a moving one. But even just like let's say I'm up on a 24 inch box or a 30 inch box, drop off and try to land. Oh, I'm, <laughs> two legs or let alone one leg. You could try two or one depending on how strong you are. But try to land. Maybe let's say an 18 inch box. Drop off. Try to keep that leg completely straight as if it's in a cast you know the knee doesn't bend at all and land on the foot and see what happens your heel is just going to smash down to the ground it's going to it's, it's going to deform and, yeah and but if you <laughs> as soon as you bend that knee even a little bit you give that like heel something to work with where the heel can come up and then you it's it's like this channel up into the hip it's yeah. like using that yeah. that series of gates to allow that force to go up into the hip otherwise it's just like it just finds that one funnel of that the ankle is a class one lever where it's like a calf raise, right. but you get blasted in a calf raise. It's like a blasting eccentric calf raise. <laughs> and, right, 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 right. So it's, but, it's, I, it's I, but I tell people that all the time. I, I tell people all the time, like, you really want to be stiff? Okay. That's, and, 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 and you go, okay, see that 40 inch it's box right there? Jump off, don't bend no place. Hit the ground, keep your knees straight, keep hips straight, keep back, keep everybody straight. Hit the ground and be stiff. Because we ain't going to have no movement. Because at that point in time, there's no movement in any. And try to have no movement at any joint. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be fun at all, you know. But once again, if you allow some deformity, some deformity, all of a sudden it gets fun. Yeah. You know, I was just um, I was just going through some material. Bill Boomer was a, a swim coach who actually, it's funny, when he started, he, he just passed away recently, actually. And he coached swimming for decades in New York and had no prior swim experience, but was like this legend with swim technique and he had this idea of you have like an aquatic signature. Basically, you just lie in the water, face down, surrender to the water, let your body do whatever. And basically how you float kind of ends up di dictating like what strokes you'd be the best at or how you end up doing them. And right. I think swimming has a lot of interesting things to offer to the, the movement world. But I think of it as like in, I was thinking actually this morning, writing a few thoughts on, well, what's your signature? If you were to apply that to sprinting, if you could... And just one of the things that I do think of is I think everyone has a hip height signature, like how high, how, you know, you could use yeah, how tall yeah. should you run, but what height should your hips be at when you run? And I look at like, I was even looking at the world championships with like the females versus the males in like the sprints and the women run with more deformity. And it's like, well, they have lower centers of mass too than a male, like a, a female has a naturally lower center of mass and we have right. different pressure systems are the the width right. of our hips and right, the shape right. of our thorax and there's like there is a signature to these things and i just think that's so cool like how much fun would it be if everyone was not if we were all robots and you know we all just gave the same three <laughs> cues and, but i think about the brick and it's like it allows you to work with your signature like in a brick being it was like a half brick right and you just put the ball of your foot on it and you're working right. with pressure in a bent leg that allows your body to work with your signature to put force back up versus right. hey just you know, run like this, hit this position. <laughs> right. Well, just, even, well even, even like I said, with the bricks, the cool thing is you learn really fast about a lot of stuff. And, and, and so, you know, most people that are trying it the first day, they don't stay on the bricks very long. They wobble on, they wobble. I mean, just trying to stay on the brick is a challenge for a lot of people. And then all of a sudden, boom, oh, because what are you trying to find? You're trying to find the strain. You're trying to find... How much strain do I need to be on this thing versus this? This is about it. And you got to remember, it's not much stress coming from the brick. It's not much. But it's enough that you're trying to you're trying to figure out how much strain do I need to stay on this thing? You know, and, and, and that becomes the thing. And, and so we was doing some things yesterday with John and, and like we was he was doing a, what we call an ISO. And so the, he's on the brick and the brick's on top of um, gym bands, the, the gym bands It's on top of that. and so. You have these, these what I call bi-directional ISO, where he is trying to pull the band up. And so at the same time, he's trying to pull the band up. What is he trying to do to his foot? Pull his foot up. So as he's trying to stand up, he also has to push his foot back down. And that's the ISO, bi-directional. I'm, 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 these, these things act in both directions. How do I, how do I create enough strength? See, now i got to create a lot of strength. I don't want no deformity now. I want enough strain to resist these bi-directional forces that's working on me right now. And so I think that's when we get into running even more, if we can resist. Because we say the same thing, the body's trying to collapse, the ground trying to push me up. How do I get enough strain to do with both of those? Yeah, it's yeah, teaching and learning. 
uh, learning how to work with strength, that action. It's not a static thing. It's a, it's an active learning process. I think that's right. just so helpful. I, you know, Darian, I think that actually, I, I had another question for you, but I think it kind of, it would veer us off course. So I, I, I think that was a, a really good way of putting all that, wrapping that, the, uh, that idea up. And, you know, I know you got a, a seminar coming up uh, with Mike Kozak. If, before we get out of here, if you just want to share a little bit about that with people and uh, then we'll be off. Uh, so, yeah, uh, November 5th and 6th, uh, Columbus, Ohio, you know, Rewire's coming up again. And so we we had a lot of, you know, this year Rewire's going to be, you know, we had a lot of stuff to it. You know, like I said, we 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 got some new words. We got some new training methods. You know, we're going to have the ISOs in there. And we're going to and we're going to even talk about stiff ankles, you know, because that's part of the base position and, and how I'm going to roll over this. Because I do. I, I don't want moving at the ankle while I'm trying to roll. I don't. I, I don't. You know. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to talk about, you know, how to use the the extras and intrics and muscles to counterbalance each other to create, you know, movement in the leg where you want the movement at, at the joint you want it at. Well, good stuff. Well, hey, uh, sounds awesome. Thank you so much, Darren. It's always good talking to you. It's every time I, I have these conversations, it's like, oh, it's been too long. So it's good to chat with you again, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, always, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. I appreciate you being here, listening to this series. If you enjoy what we're doing and want to help us out, you can leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Spotify, whatever you're listening to. would totally appreciate that. We'll see you next week with another great guest.